What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Sports Card Madness. I'm Boston Card Hunter, Nick, and I'm here with LZ, Autograph Stalker. And uh, we have a cool show today. We've got something going on here about negotiation. Because everybody uses this with cards, if you buy and sell cards. And honestly, you probably use it in life. And the reason we thought we'd do this is... You know, obviously we negotiate all the time when we buy cards, but both of us actually have some graduate school experience and we've taken courses in negotiation. And I think we've learned some things in those courses and through those books that might actually be helpful for everyone. So should be good. Yeah, Nick, that's spot on. Um, as we were discussing or planning this episode, first thing I thought of is how we negotiate every day in our life every day like yeah we're doing it with cards but for the point you made like you're negotiating with your kids in the morning to get them out the front door uh, what pair of shoes they're gonna wear that day what type of cereal they're gonna eat in the morning you're negotiating with your wife we all negotiate with our with our spouses our partners even our friends um but certainly when it comes to collectibles, whether it's in person, whether it's on eBay, whether it's buying through Facebook, whether it's buying just through a text message with somebody, we're negotiating all the time. So let's walk through just some basic steps, some things to think about. Um, also, even some books that you and I have read in the past that I think have served us very well. We can talk about those. Um, but I think... Whenever you're entering a negotiation, whether it is a is to buy a card or to get your kids to eat breakfast, <laughs> you have to assess the situation, right? So I think that's number one, is assess the situation. When it comes to cards, got to do research. Don't, please, please, please don't go into it blind. I know when you go to a card show, especially, and you have like $1,000 cash in your pocket, you want to spend that. You want to spend it quick. It's burning a hole in your pocket and you see some shiny card on the table. If you don't know anything about that card, what I would suggest is figure out what card it is, walk away, go in the corner, hop on eBay, hop on 130 point, try to figure out comps, but understand what the card is. You got to do research at first. Understand how rare it is. Look at pop counts. Um, so that's important again, in any negotiation, it's just assessing who you're, who you're negotiating with, what you're trying to negotiate for. Are there other options? Like you're buying a house, right? Are there other options or you only want to buy this one beautiful mansion on the hill overlooking the seaside? Well, yeah, that's going to be tough. But if it is a standard colonial in a certain town, you're going to be able to find other standard colonials in that certain town. Um, so it, that that's first and foremost. I, I can't stress it enough that you have to assess the situation. Um, what are your thoughts to that? Anything else you want to add to just assessing? Yeah, you know, just know what you're walking into, right? Like, mm -hmm. don't be an idiot. Like, understand what a card's worth at a certain grade or whatever understand what the other options are available. We'll get into that later. Um, but just like a, an awareness and, you know, I always say this, you know, if you come into a big set of cards or you inherit something, if there's some big change in your life, you're about to encounter something, just pause and reflect and assess, you know, it's always good to just, just chill for a second. Make mm -hmm. sure you really want it. You know, I struggle I with that. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I struggle with that. Right. It's like I make my decision. I want to go get this card, and it's like I want to go get it. I, yeah. I don't want to wait a couple of weeks. I want to go get it. But to your point, Nick, it it is important. And then sometimes it burns you the other way, man. You went after a raw eighty six Fleer set, and you were like, yeah. "That was a really good price." You walked away. Oh. You didn't even enter the negotiations because you were like, "Ah, oh, man!" And then that thing was gone, and you ended mm -hmm. up paying a couple hundred bucks more online. You know, you could yeah. have had and it those, in hand. Those cards were better quality than the ones I got too. So yeah. it's a shame. It's um, so yeah, I think it's, but that, that, that's perfect that you brought that up, Nick, because when I went to that show, I had not done my 86 flare research at that point. You were using right? the, Yeah. If I had done my research, I would have jumped on that set of cards. Yep. That's right. But 
And you would have known the price too. Instead I of hesitated, texting me. <laughs> I don't know, is this a good price or a bad price? Let me call Nick because I know he's into these. So that's that's why. That's it. Right. Gotta do research. Yeah. So yeah. I, you know, as part of this this whole assessment, some of the other things that you need to think about are uh speed is a very important one. You know, do you need this today to get it into the mail tomorrow for a signing next week? That changes everything. <laughs> so it you does. are going to be more flexible and pay a little bit more and potentially want to do a deal in person. So speed is important. Are you building a set that's going to take you 10 years to build? Whole different situation than that, right? Because now you've got time on your side. Time is always a good thing. If you have time, that's always good in a negotiation. If you don't have time, it's always bad. You're immediately starting off that way. Um, the other thing to think about is like, values like stocks and bonds, they change every day, right? And with some vintage cards, not so much. They're almost like, um, you know, fixed assets or whatever. But modern cards, you know, we, we've <laughs> Cousin Eddie was on the pod all the time, man. He'll he'll get a redemption. That thing will swing 50% both ways mm -hmm. before he even sells the thing. So just understand, like, if you're buying a modern card that could lose 50% of its value in like a day, Factor that in <laughs> to the negotiation, you know, have some kind of like, you could even be creative, right? And we'll, we'll get into this down the road. And you could say something like, um, okay, I'm going to buy this off of you, but if it doubles in price, I'll give you an extra 20 bucks just because I feel bad. Or mm -hmm. on the other flip side, if this halves in price, you give me 20 bucks, you shake on it, move on. That actually removed like a variable right there. That's like a decent thing to do in a negotiation. You'll see that's people great. flip coins, stuff like that. Um, so that's another mm -hmm. factor. It's just like, you know, the the biggest thing I want to say here on like this whole assessing the situation and just getting getting settled is just use your head, you know, just um, think clearly. It's, you know, don't go to the grocery store hungry. That's kind of what I always say to people with the negotiation, like don't, don't go in with your head in a in a wrong place. Be cool, calm, and collected, and think about mm -hmm. it rationally. Mm -hmm. I want to add a little bit to the speed part of it. That is very true. I just I was putting myself, uh, putting um, your words kind of into my shoes here with with what I've done. When I have a signing coming up, and I'm buying a card on eBay, I won't even deal with the auction side of it. I go straight to the buy it now. And I know I'm going to pay more. I go straight to buy it now because I don't have time to go through an auction or to go through, make an offer, make an offer, go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So that really is true. It, it, it Timing timing is a huge piece of it. I think about, well, I'll self-reflect self again here. I'm getting close to finishing this set that me and Nick always talk about. And now I'm getting like a little itchy, itchy uh trigger here where i'm so close that part of me feels like i'm willing to like overpay for some of these cards because i just want to finish it right so i want to overpay for it so to your point around understanding this set that i'm trying to complete i have to be realistic like am i really gonna finish this set in the next month or is this a set that honestly like these last five cards are going to really take me two years. And if that's the case, why, why, why do I want to overpay for, to check off one card to, instead of five cards left, it's four cards left. It's like, no, no, I'm doing, I'm doing this with you right now, man. You're trying to yeah. overpay for, um, yeah. More well, let's not, cards. Hey, come on. Let's, let's not share everything <laughs> with everybody. <laughs> yeah. But I am, well, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm like, man, I, just relax. He's going to do a public yeah. signing for 30 bucks tomorrow. <laughs> you will. I just got to, I have to relax. Uh, I get it. Um, but I think we've all been there before where you just have this kind of rush of, I want to get it done. Um, but let's flip that on its head. It's important for, all right, you want to assess the situation. You also want to understand kind of the speed, how quickly you need to get this done but also flip it on its head and try to understand the seller or the buyer, it depends what side you're on, but the other side, what they're dealing with. Because if, if the 
seller could understand that I, LZ, have like a, a, a quick trigger finger right now because I want to finish this set. Well, then that seller could probably take advantage of me a little bit, right? And and um, you know, maybe get a little more money out of me. So that's that is definitely an important side of it, is you have to understand the opposite side. Don't look and, too interested, right? I mean, that's just common sense. Yeah. Don't be like, oh, I really need that card. I'll do anything for that card, dude. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes if there's like one in the world, that's okay. And I have done that. Yeah. But most of the time it's fine. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with that, man. That's that's yeah. good advice. Yeah, you got to do research not only in the card but on the the opposite side of the table. What are they dealing with? Are they looking to liquidate? Are they desperate? Um, are they? You know that they got two cards left to finish the set. Um, so all of those things, it's yeah, you got to do research kind of everywhere. More knowledge is power when it comes to negotiation. Yeah. Um, the other part I would say is understanding if well again both sides but are there other buyers involved because if there is then you need to get a little more creative with how you're going to get this deal done if you know that there are four people gunning for this card um you don't necessarily have to overpay no everybody what you need to do is you need to establish a relationship with the seller exactly. exactly i will i think i brought this up very very early, very very early on in the the podcast around i've had the the opportunity to buy a few homes in my lifetime and we have never been the high bidder in either of our homes but we wrote a nice handwritten letter to the sellers Gave them a sense of who we were. Um, understand, understood a little bit about who they were, like whether they were family people, if they had, if they raised their family in this house, and that's what we wanted to do with my wife and our two kids. Um, so that is just that's that's really important. Um, and then you know it it could help out. So when you're buying when you're buying a card. And you and you know that there are other buyers. Understand what that seller's into, like what what type of person they are, what their values are. Um, if you go in there and like, yeah, I want to buy this, and then try to flip it in 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 two weeks, that's probably going to scare the seller away. Which is, might just seller, piss them off. It yeah, piss exactly. Off. It's going to piss them off. Um, yeah, especially if you have just a reputation of doing that, right? That's not going to help you in in some scenarios. Um. But if this is like an old school vintage collector who's had this set for 20 years, you want to get across to that seller that you plan to hold on to this card for another 20 years. Yeah. Pass it down to your children. You're, you need it to complete this huge set that you've been working on for, for five years. Uh, that, that goes a long way as well. You know what's huge there, man? Um, Adam... The real guy, 27, who has his, own, has his own podcast, he was on with us. He had some um, very interesting advice here. This goes along with this. So if you're actually making an offer to someone like that, you should just know your price that you're going to pay. Like if you really want this particular car that's pretty rare so badly, you don't go to Adam, who's got a, an insane collection and say, hey, what would you like sell that for and like do a dance and mess around? Nope. You say, hey, this is what it's worth. I'm willing to pay this. No BS. And it's really on him to consider whether even to, to do it with you. So take that, take that like obstacle out of the way, make it easy. Be like, I'll give you this for that whenever it works mm -hmm. for you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, I do want to touch on, I'm just trying to almost the audience probably knows I try to like to go in like chronological order. Right. So mm -hmm. you've, you've assessed the situation, you know, the type of card that you want, you understand what the value should be. You understand how quickly, you need it, uh, how quickly maybe you need to move on it. You also understand the buyer as well, maybe what's going on in, in their world. Now you're actually going to sit down and negotiate with this, this seller. And there are a few tactics uh, in this space that I think Nick and I can elaborate a bit on. And some of them come from just great books. Um, 
I think first one is the Black Swan. There was a, a great movie done, Natalie Portman, I don't know, probably 10 years ago, 15 years ago now, probably. Um, but that is a famous book. And in there, uh, you know, there there's whole situations in that movie, but there's also this famous book called The Black Swan Effect, which is like you can't foresee something wild happening. So therefore, you just need to be prepared for it, that it might happen. Um, like the stock market crashing. Like, yeah, some financial analysts were, were were able to figure that out. Or maybe like we go to war. Like some of these things like a pandemic, you just don't a pandemic. <laughs> perfect example. Right. So that could also be a major curveball that gets thrown into the situation. Say the seller is like going through a divorce, like this black swan event happens. Um, this seller lost their job. Right. That's a black swan kind of event, like quote unquote, like black swan event that's going on. It's important for you to know about those if you can. And that's why it's important to establish a relationship if you can with with, with these people. It's magic um, if you can figure it out. Um, yeah. There's always every negotiation ever has a black swan. Even if you're telling your kid to do something in the house. There could be something like your kid just had a bad exchange on social media this morning with someone. There's some factor you're missing every single time. And the best negotiations are the ones that actually figure it out. Mm -hmm. Why isn't this guy moving on this card? Why won't exactly. he accept my offer? Like what, what, what's going on? Yep. Why just did he respond? Out. Why did he respond to me with such like a cursed text? Like just a big no in capital letters. Like, <laughs> I was being so polite with him yesterday and he was being polite with me. And now I just get this big fat. No. Yeah. What, what's going on? Yeah. When I bought the MJ, um, the raw MJ, I've been working on him for two years, the signed uh, MJ rookie and like Labor Day weekend. He's like, yeah, I'm ready. Let's do it. And Out after it all, yeah. After it all went down and I mm. did the deal, I asked him why. And it, he was hanging out with his son like that weekend and his son finally said, like, I just don't really, I'm not, I don't want those cards you have anymore. I didn't mm. know that, you know, and it it was, mm -hmm. it would have been a part of the negotiation. There was no negotiation on that one, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, there's always something like that you're missing, you know, so you got to think, yeah. think what's happening. Yep. Always put yourself in the other person's shoes. Um, all right. So you're at the negotiating table. Another, and I'm going to, I'm going to quote a book, a really great book. For really anybody to read, it's called Never Split the Difference. And it is a fantastic book that is written by a hostage negotiator. Okay. It's awesome. Um, it's a great like, book. Uh, government agencies. I think he worked for like, was it NYPD? Like he's he worked, worked, for, he worked like, for the FBI. And FBI, yeah. The NYPD. And, yeah, NYPD. Yeah. And um, he just, it's these incredible stories of, I mean, I mean, you, movies are created around this stuff, right? So it's just a good read in general. And he has some great tips in there. And one of the tips that has always stuck with me is something called mirroring. When you're negotiating with somebody and it's going to feel awkward at first, but over time it almost just becomes natural and then it doesn't feel sleazy. Like it, it actually is probably going to feel a little sleazy in a way at first when you do this, but then it's just going to be part of your DNA. Some of you may even be doing it without realizing it. Yeah. Some of them, some people have this as a natural talent. So right. But right. Um, and what it is is all right. So let's say you're sitting, you're you're standing in front of somebody, and you're at, at the card table, right? They're on one side, you're on the other, and they're the seller, you're the buyer. And this particular seller has his arms crossed. Okay, you may want to consider, even though maybe you're not the type to cross your arms, is just mirror his or her body language. Go ahead and cross your arms as well. Uh, maybe the seller is leaning over the table and actually getting a little more intimate with you and a little closer than you're used to. Close talker. <laughs> Close talker, right? You also not, you don't want to get right up to their nose, but you also kind of want to move in a little bit and mirror them a little bit, right? Is So um, it's that. It's also tone. It doesn't even have to be necessarily body language, but it could be like the tone of their their voice. Um, you know, that, that could be 
uh, a piece as well. Um, that's the easiest one. So the easiest one to understand, if this is like confusing to you, just picture somebody who's just barking like a frat boy on the other side of the table, just like really big personality, right? And then picture somebody else who's very timid and quiet and shut down, right? Um, a talking style is going to work differently for each of those people. Yep. And it is. therefore a negotiation style will work differently. It's going to turn, it's going to turn somebody right off, right? That, that quiet talker, um, it's going to turn them off. Uh, there is, well, before I get there, I was going to say there's actually a flip side to this, but I don't want to go to the flip side to that yet. Cause this is like almost if things are breaking down, but let's say things are still going. Okay. You can also do this not in person, but you can do it over text. If you're texting back and forth with a seller on a deal and you can just get a sense of their language is like a bit more upbeat. Like maybe they're real friendly. Like, hey, how you doing? How was your weekend? Ba 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 ba. You don't just want to like go in and say like, I'll give you a hundred dollars for that card, right? Oh, my weekend was good. How was your weekend? What'd you do with the kids, right? It's just kind of. But you might get sellers that are that are like, what yeah. do you want to do with this deal? All right, these people are very. I'm actually like fact. that. I'm a I'm a no BS type of person. I don't are like you? the how's the weather stuff. Um, nah. So if you're ever going to negotiate <laughs> with me, make it quick, make it punchy. I don't have time. All right. Maybe it's because I'm older now. Take that note down. I actually do <laughs> like the pleasantries a little bit. You I, do. I really you do. do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, all right. So that that all of everything that me and Nick have just said, let's say in the last like three minutes is all part of this book. It's a great book. And we're not, yeah. I'm not getting any royalties for this thing. It's just a fantastic book. So go out, read it. It's called Never Split the Difference. Um. I want to do one more thing, Nick, is the opposite of that. If things are breaking down, if you um, maybe the negotiating is not going the direction you want, and this particular person uh, has a very like loud tone voice and he's getting mad at you for something, you can actually do the opposite of what that person is doing and slow things down mm -hmm. very much. If they are going a mile a minute, you go down. And the author of the book actually calls it like the um, the late night DJ voice. Yeah. You slow things down and just say, all right, it seems like we may be at an impasse here. Help me understand why you're frustrated. And if someone's like, bah, 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 that can really make a difference. Yeah. So I would say if things are going might not work, but it can't, yeah, it might not. That's like the last resort. That's yeah. the last resort. If, if, uh, if things aren't, if things aren't going well, yeah. um, all right, that, that's just a few, again, I'm trying to go chronological here. Um, Nick, what else? Yeah, I mean, I want to say one other thing here. Okay. We're we're talking about in-person exchanges, and mm. half of you may not have any in-person contact with somebody you're negotiating with. And just remember that text-based communication, you lose about 93% of all communication from it. Mm. And you're not, you can still mirror. You can tell, hey, what's up, man? You know, you can tell who somebody is a little bit on text. Try to mirror that way, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I was going to go into Batna, but I want to make sure that's that's cool with your flow. LZ is the uh, flow um, <laughs> I just thought of one other. Let me All just right. do one other. This is super easy. It's going to be really hard at first. Really hard. When you're doing negotiation. All right, I'm going to do I'm going to do two different scenarios for you, Nick. First scenario. I'm trying to get a $1000 card off of Nick, okay? And he says, I'll sell it to you for 1500 And I respond to him and say, Nick, I love your card, but $1,500 is too much money. Versus, Nick, I love your card, and $1,500 is probably a bit too much money for this deal. It is amazing how just by replacing but with and helps. Yeah. And you're probably thinking of this like, well, Larry, uh, LZ, that doesn't flow. Like, I'm not used to saying that. I'd say but all the time. It makes a big difference. 
So just try it. The next time you're going to go, again, it could be your kids. Try it with your kids tomorrow morning. Try it with your, your partner tonight with trying to figure out what you want for dinner and trying to convince your partner that you want pizza when they want, I don't know, stir fry. Try saying and instead of but. It'll make a big and difference. And I'll give you a hug. So LZ will talk about expanding the pie in a little bit. And that's what the and leads to and mm -hmm. why it works. So cool. That's it. You can go to your uh, Batman I like it. now. All right. This is my favorite. This is my favorite thing. So Batman makes no sense. I'm sure most of you have no idea what that means. But it is best alternative to a negotiated agreement. All right. And it's very simply saying that... There are alternatives to doing this deal. One of those alternatives is to not do it. And wow. sometimes <laughs> that's actually the best option because mm. A, it buys you time. B, it could expand other options to you. And um, C, it also gives you a little bit of power and puts you in the driver's seat. Like you have the power to enter and leave this negotiation as you see fit. You're not tractor beamed in there. You're not stuck. So... You know, if you're doing a deal and the price doesn't feel right, your alternative may be wait eight months and get a better price. Or your alternative may be to get it from somebody else. If it's a one of one, your alternative, just walk away and get one of the mm -hmm. other 2,000 one of ones. Um, zing. So I, I think like that's important to understand in the very beginning before you enter the negotiation. Like, what is your best alternative? before you even walk into it. So if you do walk away, what are your other two or three options? Just have them ready. Like I've gone into stuff saying, hey, I'm about to do a deal, but if I don't, are you cool with this? Mm -hmm. Boom, my Batna is set up, man. I literally have one. Now I'm gonna go in and I'm so prepared. If it just, it's just, then it's just math at that point. And it's like, the math doesn't work. Oh, well, <laughs> then yeah. you walk away. So just like not doing the deal, is always an option, guys. Like you are allowed mm -hmm. to abort a deal at any time mm -hmm. for any reason. Um, nine out of 10 times, in my experience, the card's still there in a few weeks, even if they say yeah. it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. um, would you figure out your BATNA before you go to the card show then? Is that where you yeah, think you should do it? Of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. You definitely yeah. need to like understand, you know, your flexibility and mm -hmm. the other fish in the sea. Yep. Yep. Okay. Very good. Uh, Nick teased, um, kind of how do you, how do you, it's something, you know, just expanding your pie to get a deal done. This is simply, all right, maybe you're at an impasse. You can't get this particular deal done, but nothing's ever dead. All right. Nick said, you can wait a couple weeks. You can wait a month. You can come back to them or, you can figure out, again, this is through research with the seller or the buyer, um, what else they might be interested in. Can you expand this deal to get it done? Yeah, the I've done this so many times. <laughs> and the audience, I'm sure a lot of our audience, they probably play fantasy sports, right? You're trying to get a trade done and, and you want, I don't know, whatever it is. Uh, you want Patrick Mahomes in this deal. And one for one deals don't work, but all of a sudden you do a two for three deal where you throw three players and, and you get two back from a homes. All of a sudden that deal gets done. It's like, why does that happen? Well, because you were able to understand that the other side needed two additional players. So you could absolutely do that with cards. Um, whatever you're trying to, whatever you're trying to get, just look at the rest of your collection and say, is there anything else I'd be willing to give up? And then try to understand the seller's interest. And, oh, I'm trying to get these vintage cards, but the seller also likes, I don't know, uh, modern NBA cards. And I just happen to go to a couple of games and get some Knicks players, autos, and I just got a Luka auto and i got oh, oh maybe you're lucky enough to get a wemby auto i don't even know if he's signing i think maybe he is um but now all of a sudden you can go to that that seller and say hey all right i, I it doesn't feel like we're gonna be able to get this deal done normally you'd say but 
Or are you going to say, and what if I throw in a Luca rookie or a Jason Tatum rookie card, or I got Jalen Brunson's autograph at the Knicks game last week. Are you into Knicks players? Like, would that help get this deal done? So that is just all around expanding the pie. Try to figure out what else you can include. Anything you want to add to that, Nick? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think you nailed it, man. Like yeah. the, expanding the pie doesn't have to be a good, it could be just like, Hey, I'll help you with this. Um, as I joked earlier, I'll, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's your family. Um, it doesn't have to be like a thing or like a monetary mm. exchange. Like I've mm. done better deals and just promised to help people with players' addresses. I've um, done deals with the promise that I'll intro them to other collectors. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do that add value that aren't like things and money. Mm -hmm. um, so just think of that. And again, this gets into your your research. Black Swan, expanding the pie. What other stuff matters to them? Are they getting a divorce and selling all this stuff? Hey, I'll do this and I'll get you a steak dinner too, man. We'll go out. You know, I'll, I'll have you meet some lady friends of mine. Like that might expand <laughs> hey. the pie really fast. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think like you, you gotta, you gotta think of that stuff. Um, mm. So, all right, LZ, let me see. I'm going to attempt the flow here. As I said, you're okay. the flow guy, but All right. oh, we, we've kind what of expanded else? the pie. We've kind yep. of talked through things. We're pretty much, we're either going to do the deal or, or walk mm -hmm. away right now, right? Mm -hmm. So if we do the deal, that's one scenario. And if we don't do the deal, it's another. But I think in both cases here, um, after the deal's done or after you, you've walked away, you probably should make sure the other party's happy. They're happy with you, happy with the exchange because... This is like a knitting circle, man. Like the hobby is like, if you do somebody wrong, it's it's like, it could be oh, game yeah. over um, mm -hmm. for a lot of people. You know, a couple of people have, have pissed me off and I won't do deals with them. And I'll, I will tell lots of people not to do deals with them, vice versa. There, there's a guy out in California that, you know, I've done tens of thousands of dollars of deals with and I've recommended people they've done the same. I would trust him with my children. So mm -hmm. um, either way, like make sure we're cool. And if you don't walk away, that's fine. Like this is this is like cardboard with pictures on it. It's all right. Like it's not like medicine or something like that. Just, you know, just make sure they're cool. And like, you never know. They might change their mind in a couple of weeks. They might have something else you want down the road. They might know somebody. Oh, hey, Nick was kind of a hard ass, but you know, you've got something, you seem to be more flexible to make the intro. So happiness, like just, it's like the golden rule, man. Like, I think that's important at this point in the negotiation, like when oh, you, yeah. or not. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So that's a perfect way to, cool. To finish up a negotiation. Yeah. That's perfect. I like it. I think yeah. this is a lot of good info. So, yeah. um, we were, we were going to do a little bit here, right? We uh, yeah. we got some feedback from the audience. They wanted us to uh, to lighten up and have some fun. So, LZ oh, and I, we always we always have fun, Nick. Yeah, we but, always have fun. Yeah, but no. we're gonna do uh, nego best negotiation. This is part of like help for the audience, right? So yeah. there's a lot of good movies that feature negotiation, Research. and I think mm -hmm. uh, that will help you. So LZ and I are gonna go do a quick draft of our favorite negotiation movies. Are we doing three each? Let's do three eight. Three each in All right. draft music. Uh, I don't know any draft music. But I'm trying <laughs> to think of some draft music. I'll have right the producer now. add something. But yeah, we'll we'll add some draft music. All right, who's got first pick? Uh, I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you first pick, but it's a snake draft, Nick. So I get to go two in a row after All right. your. After That's your cool. First. That's cool. So this will be this will be pretty rapid fire here. All yeah. right, my first pick. I had to look up the name of this, but. For the audience, it's called Glenn Gary Ross. But what I would recommend you do is literally Google Alec Baldwin, Coffee is for Closers. Watch that 10 minute scene. Oh, it's so good. Beautiful. It's sales, mm -hmm. negotiation, everything all wrapped in one. That's my number one pick. Amazing movie. It was actually a play turned into a movie. Yeah, that was. Um, what are they selling in that movie again, Nick? This is like, um, vacation what stuff. You know, it's like, is it, oh, it's like timeshares exactly. or something. Yeah, it's or... just timeshares on index yeah. cards. Yeah. Yeah. I highly recommend that movie. If you haven't seen it, it is like, it's, it's just the bomb when it comes to negotiations and sales and great actors in it too. Like the best, uh, Chino, uh, uh, Ed Baldwin, Harris. 
Ed Harris, uh, Jack Lemon, Kevin Spacey. Like, yeah, Kevin Spacey. It's it, loaded. It, it's loaded. <laughs> um, I will say that there are definitely some dry parts to it, but I think when going into that movie, this is not going to be great. like a Marvel Endgame. It's not that type of movie. Just but sit it down and watch. It's great. Very well written. Uh, yeah, that it's that was going to be my number one. So it uh, doesn't. All right, you get the second you, and third pick. I knew you were going to. Okay. <laughs> Second, the second one that, well, second pick. I'm going to go with the Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street is such a good movie. Oh, such a good movie. The scene where, um, all right, now go ahead and sell me this pen. Oh, it's great. It's a great lesson. <laughs> it's a great lesson, right? Try to sell it's your great. son a pen. Just yeah. try. Yeah. It's harder than you think. Mm-hmm. It is. So there's a lot of, I mean, it's a great movie, but a lot of lessons uh, to be learned in that movie. So that's, that's number two. All right. That's off the board. I had that one. All right. That is, okay. Um, I'm afraid you're going to steal if I don't say it right now. Um, <laughs> I am going to say it's going to be the same type of theme. I'm going to, it's, it's Wall Street. Just Wall Street. The, the movie. OG Wall Street. The OG. The OG. I, I oh, can see it in Nick's eyes. You <laughs> punk. That was my next one. <laughs> Gordon Gecko, baby. Yeah, Gordon Gecko. Uh based in the eighties. Oh, it's just such a, you know, New York City in the eighties, Wall Street, fund managers, investment bankers, the deals they made. That's number so that would be uh the third pick in the draft, Nick. All right. Man, I have an obvious one. You're going to take it next, I think. And I, I'm actually not going to do it because I wanted to do a less obvious one. We're from Boston. Um, great movie. Good mm -hmm. Will Hunting. Amazing mm -hmm. movie, right? Watch that scene in the courtroom when Matt Damon, for the 17th time, out negotiates an opposing lawyer and a judge and gets off from like beating somebody up in the street, the things he quoted. So that is a negotiation that... Obviously, he had a special brain, but it's a lesson that you can just be ultra prepared for a situation and talk your way out of it or into it, and it should apply to cards. So Google Hunting, there you go. Okay. All right. So that was your... Well, you get you get two in a row now. So you can oh. choose that last one that you oh, wanted to do. This is great. So you're going to close it out. Snake boiler, draft. Boiler room, baby. Boiler room. <sighs> uh, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. man. It's, yeah. just, it's just a, like a ragtag... You know, bunch of guys like just getting good at their craft and like mm -hmm. just being sneaky with, <laughs> with like negotiating. Um, <laughs> just oh man, it it's it's great. Just check it out. I almost yeah. don't even want to steal the thunder of it because like just by describing it is mm -hmm. like a spoiler for the movie. So mm -hmm. boiler room, that's my uh, that's my last pick. All right, so my last one is actually going to be really off the wall. I'm gonna I'm gonna share with some of the other ones I thought of, but I'm not going to go with it. All right. I thought of Captain Phillips um, with um, what's his name? Um, Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Oh, Tom uh, Hanks. Yeah. Tom Hanks. Great, great one. Uh, there's also the one called The Negotiator. Another great one. But I'm going to go with a random one, and it just popped in my head. The movie Whiplash about a jazz drummer and his crazy, crazy teacher. Okay. The lesson learned around that is at the end of the movie. Oh, this is probably going to be a spoiler alert. So block years if if you haven't seen the movie yet, but I highly recommend it. The teacher, they have this big falling out between the drummer, the student, and the teacher. And it's really bad. And they both are screwing each other over throughout the whole movie. But at the end, the teacher understands the student and what drives him. And because of that, he screws him over one last time, and it is epic. So the lesson learned around that is just know the other side of the table. Just know the other side of the table. So it's not a negotiation movie, but there's a lot of like understanding. I know that how this drives this person. I understand how this teacher is driven. I understand how this student is driven, and we're going to play off each other. So... That was a kind of a wild card one that I wanted to add. I mean, it's also like how to, it's like the difference between being pretty good at something and being like just filthy, filthy good mm -hmm. at something 
And that that kind of applies to it as well. Just if you haven't seen that movie, it's ridiculous. Like, especially if yes. you're a musician or trying to learn an instrument, it's like, mm -hmm. my God, I need to watch that again. All right. Wow. Um, I first, feel like first ever draft, Nick. Yeah, that was a good draft. Books. I think I think we're good. Um, it'll be cool to hear what the audience has got for for other stuff we haven't thought of. But hopefully, this was a good episode for everyone. Where you know we walked through kind of like you know, you want to get something, you want to enter a negotiation, here's some tools. This is how it worked out. We walked through the entire process and uh, you'll probably be able to hopefully pick up a couple of things here and read the books that we mentioned. Um, gosh, there's another one. I'll put it in the show notes. I'm, I'm thinking of it's, um, it's getting, pa uh, getting past no or getting to yes or something like that. I pro it slipped my brain for now, but I promise I'll put that in the show notes along with the other stuff we mentioned as well. What um, is Nick? What is the book around? Um, uh, based off of the secret that we that we read, uh, Napoleon Hill. Yeah, yeah, Think and Grow Rich. That's yeah, just, think, uh, think and that's grow required rich. reading for every human being. Um, yeah. I want my son's nine. He, I'm going to make him read that soon. Yeah. Um, if you want to yeah. be just successful in life, read that book. Yeah. Period. All right. Period. To your point, I'm thinking. But I'll rattle another... these all off. I'll put them in the yeah. show notes. I'll send you a couple as well, Nick, because I just Sweet. thought of a completely different one too. Cool. All right. Okay. Is that it, LZ? That is it. Sweet. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.